I'd like to go through a few cases of lumbosacral radiculopathy, which is a disorder of the lumbar or sacral nerve root or roots or their spinal nerve. And the cases we go through may represent a mimicking condition that presents as a radiculopathy, but may be in the spinal cord, a myelopathy, or a peripheral nerve. So as we go through each case, try to localize the lesion. Also identify any warning signs or red flags that suggest a more systemic or widespread involvement, or it could be an emergency that requires immediate attention. Come up with a differential diagnosis, including the most likely diagnosis, and the best next steps for each patient. The first case is a 40-year-old woman who presents with a one-week history of severe back, groin, and anterior thigh pain bilaterally that began after lifting a child. Aspirin has helped reduce the pain slightly. She has diabetes mellitus and was treated for a urinary tract infection two months ago. She's afebrile and has grade 4 out of 5 thigh adduction strength bilaterally and a positive femoral nerve stretch test on both sides. L1 and L2 spinous processes are tender to percussion. The first red flag in this case is the patient's pain pattern. It's bilateral and it represents an upper lumbar distribution being in the groin and anterior thigh, which is L1 and L2 dermatomes. So when you have a suspected case of lumbosacral radiculopathy, you should know that 90% of radiculopathies are unilateral in the lumbar and sacral areas. So this case, if it is a radiculopathy, it's bilateral, so that's very rare. Another rare feature here is the upper lumbar distribution. So the most common causes of radiculopathy are degenerative disorders, including uh, disc herniation, spondylolisthesis, and spinal stenosis. And disc herniation at the upper lumbar levels is very rare. It's less than 3% at these levels. The fact that it began after lifting a child doesn't quite tell us much. It could be a disc herniation. It could not be. Aspirin has helped reduce the pain that doesn't quite tell us much at this point. The fact that she has diabetes mellitus and a recent urinary tract infection is very significant. In the context of a suspected radiculopathy, when a patient has risk factors for immunodeficiency and signs of recent infection, you have to be concerned about discitis, abscess, spondylodiscitis, or really any infection of the spine. Even though she's afebrile, I'm still considering discitis. Only about half of the patients with discitis that present with radiculopathy have a fever. And also she's taking aspirin, which could be lowering her temperature. She has thigh adduction weakness, which helps us localize the deficits to L1 or L2 nerve roots. And the femoral nerve stretch test does basically the same thing. So now we're thinking L2. Spinous percussion tenderness agrees with the suspicion of infection. So based on the history and physical exam, you should be suspicious of discitis in the upper lumbar spine. The other differential that I have here is a disc herniation between L1 and L2 or L2 or L3. Let's compare these two conditions. So both conditions can present with segmental deficits, weakness, sensory loss, hyporeflexia, and there's not really a reflex here because it's an upper lumbar distribution. So the risk factors are a little bit different too. So she's immune deficient possibly because diabetes mellitus, the recent infection, and that puts some more evidence toward discitis. Same thing with the spinous percussion. But really both of these conditions are rare. Like upper lumbar disc herniations, we talked about 3%. And discitis is not an everyday thing, but considering her risk factors, I would consider this to be the most likely diagnosis. So the next steps in this case is referral to the emergency department. She needs a further workup, imaging, and treatment. So we went ahead and got the films in this case, and you can compare this end plate, how smooth it is, to down here. It's very indistinct. It's destroyed. And this is diagnostic of discitis or spondylodiscitis in this case. So the history and physical were very suggestive of discitis, but the x-ray shows us that, yes, this is what we're dealing with. 
you should no longer at this point be suspecting a disc herniation based on the film, even though there's some narrowing which can be suggestive of degenerative disc disease, we wouldn't be expecting this level of destruction of the end plate with typical spine degeneration. Here's a 30-year-old woman who presents with a six-month history of tingling in the medial left knee and left medial leg. She's a musician and plays viola da gamba. On physical exam, there's a lack of sharp, dull discrimination of the medial left leg with normal strength and reflexes of the lower extremities. There's a negative Valsalva test. There's a positive Tinell's test at the left adductor canal, reproducing pain to the medial malleolus. There's a positive femoral nerve stretch test on the left side. Based on the pain pattern, we're suspecting two things. L4 radiculopathy or saphenous nerve entrapment or compression. The distribution of both of these disorders is virtually identical. You can see here, this could be the L4 and it could be saphenous. We don't really know at this point. We just have a pain pattern. But when you look at what she does for a living, you can see this instrument's pressing here, right on the adductor canal, right where the saphenous nerve goes through. So I'm already starting to suspect a peripheral nerve lesion. There's a sensory deficit in this area here on the medial leg. However, the strength and reflexes are preserved in the lower extremities. This is very important. So when you have normal strength and reflexes, this will make the likelihood of radiculopathy much less likely. And we're leaning towards peripheral nerve lesion because the saphenous nerve is purely sensory. So if all you have is a sensory deficit, but no strength and reflex deficit, we're leaning towards saphenous nerve now. With an L4 radiculopathy, you would expect over here patellar hyporeflexia and possibly quadricep weakness as well. And you may have a Valsalva test with a radiculopathy as well, especially in a disc herniation. Tinell's test is in more evidence for peripheral nerve entrapment. So you're tapping here and it's triggering her pain down the leg. The femoral nerve stretch test is classically for the L2 through L4 nerve roots. However, in this case, it seems like we're getting a false positive. You can get nerve tension test positives as seen in this article on peripheral nerve entrapments. So it's almost misleading in this case. So just to review, these are my top two differentials. Saphenous nerve lesion is my most likely diagnosis because we have normal reflex and strength, a negative Valsalva, and we have her risk factors with the musical instrument compressing her thigh. The next steps in this case is all conservative treatment. And you may even want to think about putting some sort of pad here to protect her thigh. Here's a 28 year old man who presents with a one year history of low back stiffness and buttock pain that radiates down the posterior left thigh into the calf. On physical exam, there's normal sensory, motor, and reflexes. There's a positive sacral thrust test on the left side, which reproduces a chief complaint a positive sacroiliac joint distraction test on the left, and Gainsland's test is also positive on the left side. There's a rash seen on both knees. So this pain pattern represents possibly an S1 radiculopathy. But as we move forward, we're seeing, again, like the last case, strength is normal and reflex is normal. Same thing with sensory. So with all these three things being normal, this really helps out rule out an S1 radiculopathy. And so if it's not a radiculopathy, what is it then? So now we're testing the sacral iliac joint and we're finding a lot of positive tests, orthopedic tests that provoke sacroiliac joint pain. When you have three of these tests 
it really increases the likelihood that the pain is coming from the sacroiliac joint. And you might wonder where sacroiliac joint pain usually refers is the posterior thigh or buttock area, and it usually does not go past the knee. And I found one study saying that 18% of sacroiliac joint pain will go past the knee into the leg. However, this study excluded inflammatory arthritide patients, so it's kind of confusing. And I don't really know what percentage of these patients will get leg pain, but some of them do, is my point. And when you see this rash, you should immediately suspect psoriasis, and psoriatic arthritis in this case, because it's red, it's on extensor surfaces, and you can see these silvery scales. So he does meet criteria for psoriatic arthritis, depending on which criteria you use. And we got an x-ray of the sacroiliac joint in this case, and we're seeing that it's a little irregular here. Compare that to the smooth margins here. But what's really interesting is this sclerosis, subchondral sclerosis. It's very, very white right next to the joint. And if you compare side to side, it's asymmetrical. So this is unilateral, or some say asymmetrical, sacroiliitis. And for this x-ray, we have two things in the differential. Psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis are the two things that mainly cause this type of pattern on imaging. And so my top two differentials for this case is psoriatic arthritis and a lumbar disc herniation between L5 and S1 causing an S1 radiculopathy. And as we said before, the lack of segmental deficits is what helps us rule out radiculopathy in this case. Same thing with Valsalva. Even though this is more common, when you have the classic features of psoriatic arthritis and you can rule in the SI joint as the pain origin, then you should start to think about sacroiliitis pain referral. And I'm saying pain referral, but really there's new theories coming out, new ideas about where the pain comes from in the sacroiliac joint. So when you have an inflammatory arthritis of the sacroiliac joint, it's thought that substance P and other mediators leak out and irritate the lumbosacral plexus or the lumbosacral trunk that's passing right over the joint. And other people say it could be the edema as well that's irritating it or pressing against it. So the next step in this case is co-management with a rheumatologist. Here's a 70-year-old man who presents with a three-week history of insidious onset of pain that radiates down the left lateral the, sorry, the right lateral leg into the dorsum of the foot and toes. So on this side over here. On physical exam, there's a foot drop on the right side. Hyperesthesia of the painful area. Two out of five right tibialis anterior and extensor hallucis longus strength. A normal toe walk on both sides. Grade two Achilles and patellar reflexes. And there's an absent right medial hamstring reflex, whereas it's grade two on the left side. Straight leg raise is positive on the right side and provokes the patient's pain. A rash is noted over the anterior right shin, which is shown here. The first red flag in this case is the patient's age. When you have a suspected lumbosacral radiculopathy in an elderly patient, you want to be concerned about cancer, infection, and potentially also fracture, like pathologic fracture, compression fracture, insufficiency fracture. And so he's having pain into the dorsum of the foot. This pain pattern here is classic for L5 nerve root. And that agrees with the weakness here, the foot drop, extensor halysis longus. There's lots of signs pointing to S2, I mean for L5 and ruling out S2 with the normal toe walk. So the reflexes being normal in the Achilles, that's less likely to be a sacral radiculopathy. And when we have the absent right medial hamstring reflex, very likely now that this is L5. We have sensory distribution, we have weakness, and now we have reflex as well. So we know it's L5. But do we know why? And when you see the rash, you should be thinking, 
varicella zoster, or shingles. Because rarely, uh, shingles can cause radiculopathy, especially in elderly or immune-compromised patients or patients with HIV. And it can go into the distal extremities and be a dermatomal rash, a dermatomal vesicular rash. And so that's what we're seeing here. So there's a few other conditions that cause radiculopathy and also present with a rash, but the rash looks quite different. So the next steps here are medication and potentially a splint as well.